so it's a pleasure to have Susan Friedlander. So of, of course, she's a member uh, uh, this uh, year, unfortunately remotely for the reason that you uh, uh, very well know. And she will talk about Kolmogorov, von Sager, and the stochastic model for turbulence. And now I give the um, word to her. Well, Camillo, thank you very much for the invitation to speak here. And also thank you very much for the invitation to be a member at the Institute. Um, sadly for me, it's a virtual member, um, but I, I'm still enjoying it. So what I'll be talking about is a very big subject, turbulence, and I'll be touching on just a few aspects of this very big subject. Um, well, turbulence is something that has fascinated uh, scientists, uh, for example, here's an experiment, um, over the decades, over even the centuries. It's fascinated artists. Um, it fascinates people um, for practical reasons. We see uh, turbulence here in the oceans. We see turbulence here in the atmosphere. Um, but exactly what it is, um, it is well, there isn't a precise, well-defined definition of turbulence that's uniformly agreed upon, at least as far as I know. Um, one can say turbulence is a pattern of fluid motion with chaotic changes in the velocity. Turbulent flows are highly irregular. It's a stochastic phenomenon. Turbulent flows have strong vorticity generated by something known as a vortex tube stretching uh, in three dimensions. Um, Richard Feynman described turbulence as the most important unsolved problem in classical physics, and it is still an unsolved problem. So what I will be talking about is, is some very specific um, results that have been obtained um, and give you a little background, but of course, it, this will not be covering the whole of this important issue. Um, so in particular, what I'm going to talk about, at least later on in the talk, is a stochastic shell model for turbulence. So this is not turbulence as obtained from uh, the fluid equations themselves, but rather um, a motivated from the fluid equations <laughs> uh, shell model for turbulence. And it's joint work with Nathan Glatz-Holtz at Tulane and Vlad Vikol. And I have unfortunately not been able to actually easily update my uh, transparencies. Vlad, as some of you probably know, is now a professor at Courant. Yeah, we are claiming. Yeah, you can claim him too. <laughs> He's great, absolutely great. Um, so the Euler equations. Well, in 1755, Euler published actually in a, um, a, a German and, uh, publication. Uh, he displayed to us uh, the now very famous Euler equations. And they look remarkably simple, but they are in fact remarkably challenging. So what are the Euler equations? Here they are written down where uh, U is the velocity vector, a function of space and time, P is a pressure scalar, a function of space and time, and there may be an external force. And these are the equations for an incompressible fluid, which mathematically means that the divergence of the velocity field is equal to zero throughout the motion. Um, and the first equation is actually just a statement of Newton's second law of motion uh, in the context of a fluid. So we have, and we're thinking of a constant density fluid. Here we have the acceleration of the fluid and it's being driven by a pressure gradient. Uh, conceivably, there's also a forcing, an external forcing in our problem. Um, and as far as any comments that I make about the Euler equations, I'm going to be um, assuming that I'm in R3 or T3. Um, we're particularly interested in three-dimensional equations, uh, but the challenge of boundary conditions on a, in a bounded domain is uh, sort of another kettle of fish that I will be avoiding by restricting my interest to uh, whole space or periodic. Um, so. Now, the Navier-Stokes equations came along um, considerably later in the next century. Um, and they are, again, the Euler equations, these terms that we have here, augmented by uh, uh, the Laplacian multiplied by a, co a coefficient. Um, and Navier and then Stokes made an argument as to why this is the appropriate mathematical expression we should have in the equations of motion for a viscous fluid. 
new here is the kinematic viscosity of the fluid, measuring um, how much friction there is in the fluid as the particles slip over each other. Um, and now this limit as the viscosity goes to zero is a very singular limit for a number of reasons. Um, one obvious reason is that this is the most highly differentiated term in our equations. And here the um, coefficient viscosity going to zero will change the order of the equations. Uh, now, as probably many of you know, um, both for Euler and Navier-Stokes, the sort of the, the most fundamental questions what one asks about uh, a partial differential equation are open questions of existence, uniqueness, and regularity of both systems of equations are open and very, very challenging. Uh, one, a quantity that is important both for Euler and Navier-Stokes and a quantity that's important in many physical problems is the energy. So here is the kinetic energy defined in the usual way. Now, I wonder why that's come up. Oh, it's gone away. Um, so uh, the energy balance equation, well, for the Euler equation, we take the Euler equation, we pair it with U, we integrate over space, and we get the energy balance equation, the time rate of change of the energy is equal to a term that's coming from the nonlinearity in the Euler equation. So the nonlinearity is this U dot grad U term. We've now paired it with U. We've got a trilinear term here integrated over space. And then if there's a forcing term, we have the contribution of forcing here too. This quantity, this trilinear term, uh, is referred to as the energy flux term, and its symbol is capital Pi. And uh, capital Pi is the hero of my talk. Um, so now when U is sufficiently smooth, and it's easy to see basically by integrating by parts these vector expressions in three dimensions, when U is sufficiently smooth and we're allowed to pull over the derivative, uh, then this quantity Pi is equal to zero. Uh, if we don't have any force, this means conservation of energy. Or if we, um, in other words, no dissipation of energy in the Euler equations. If U is sufficiently smooth so that pi is equal to zero. And now this question of what does it mean to be sufficiently smooth um, was in some sense uh, answered or at least conjectured by Onsaga in a paper in 1949, uh, where he stated, every weak solution to the Euler equations with Holder exponent h greater than one third does not dissipate energy. In other words, pi is equal to zero. And on the other side, he conjectured, there exist weak solutions with smoothness such that H is less than or equal to a third, which indeed dissipate energy. And this okay. process is referred to as anom anomalous or turbulent dissipation. Um, anomalous because here dissipation is happening without friction, without uh, any obviously um, dissipative mechanism um, uh, as there is in the Navier-Stokes equations. May I ask, uh, I think uh, when uh, Camilo gave a talk, I asked the same question. Did uh, Onsaga really talk about weak solutions or he had a different formulation? Uh, he had a different, a different formulation. Um, although weak solutions were known, I mean, Leray's formulation of weak yeah. solutions um, for the fluid equations, I think was in something like 1935. Um, but was Ansaga, well, I, my guess is he was. <laughs> Ansaga was actually a chemist, but he was a very mathematical chemist. Uh, yeah. I mean, his Nobel Prize is for chemistry. Um, and my guess is he was aware of it. Um, I don't think he actually used the expression weak solutions in his conjecture. Um, but he, he, he gives a definition. Yeah, he gives yeah, the well, definition, definition. Fourier coefficients. Right? He gives the definition to the yeah. Fourier coefficients. You, yeah, you can yeah. prove as an exercise that it's entirely it's equivalent. equivalent. It's actually equivalent. Solutions. Yeah. Okay. But it's that I'm sure. Uh, so, well, I, I, Peter and Camillo, uh, you certainly have experts in the audience. Camillo is, I presume, one could I, just I'm not expert. say one of I'm the just... world's experts in this yeah, whole yeah. area. Um, yeah. I'm just so asking I'm, basic questions. Okay, fine. <laughs> um, and I'm very happy if Camillo answers some of these basic questions. So, okay, on Saga. Um, so now if we go to the Navier-Stokes equations and uh, once again, construct the 
uh, energy balance equation for Navier-Stokes, we have the terms that we had before, but we have the, this, this additional term coming from the dissipation due to friction. So here we have a term that is very obviously dissipative um, since the, this quantity uh, is a negative quantity um, in terms of the energy balance. So um, if we, define, or if as people have, uh, considered this notion of uh, the mean energy dissipation rate, which here the symbol I've written as epsilon nu. So by that, we mean the dissipation rate for an ensemble of solutions, uh, u nu to the Navier-Stokes equations. So here is this um, quantity, the mean energy dissipation rate written in terms of uh, a suitable average. A suitable average constructed uh, from the putative statistically steady states of the Navier-Stokes equations. And I say putatively because rigorously the existence of such statistically steady states directly from the Navier-Stokes equations has yet to be uh, proved. Um, so this quantity then is very important as far as the Navier-Stokes equations um, and the concept of energy dissipation in the Navier-Stokes equations. And this is the quantity um, that plays the role in uh, Kolmogorov's theory of turbulence. Um, Kolmogorov's theory of turbulence says that, um, well, as a fundamental ansatz uh, for three-dimensional homogeneous turbulence is what's known now known as the dissipation anomaly of the energy in the inviscid limit, namely that this energy dissipation rate coming from Navier-Stokes equation does not go to zero as nu goes to zero, but goes to some positive quantity. Um, and connected with that is this famous two third, rather five thirds spectrum um, for Kolmogorov's theory of turbulence, um, namely that the uh, uh, energy cascade um, goes via a minus five thirds law in the region of uh, three dimensional homogeneous turbulence, this region being referred to as the inertial range. So, okay, well, of course there should be, and there is um, very good arguments to make a connection between Onsaga and Kolmogorov. So um, the arguments will say that the mean energy dissipation rate of turbulent stationary Euler solutions um, should match the vanishing viscosity limit uh, of the mean en energy dissipation rate for the statistically and putative statistically steady states of the Navier-Stokes equations. And this uh, notion of the um, connection between Onsaga and Kolmogorov uh, is well known. It has been discussed uh, in the literature over the past decades by many uh, experts, and I've just named a few of them here, uh, Frisch, Einstein, Boyash, Tamam, and some of my colleagues more, uh, more recently. Um, and so if we assume that the statistically steady states of the Navier-Stokes equations, which I've labeled U with a viscosity term nu here, uh, converge in an L2 average sense to the, uh, again, putative statistically steady states of the Euler equation, then what this means is that epsilon, the um, vanishing viscosity dissipation rate from the Navier-Stokes should equal the ensemble average of pi, pi being that uh, flux term coming from the Euler equation. So this, this is something that would be highly desirable to prove rigorously um, and again is completely open for a rigorous mathematical proof. Um, well, there are conditions which ensure that pi is equal to zero, which means energy conservation side of Onsaga. Um, and uh, these uh, conditions, um, well, have been studied, um, stated um, over the decades, maybe the first very nice way of uh, making an argument uh, came from Gregory Eink in 94, who proved energy conservation uh, under a somewhat stronger assumption than Holder of one third. Um, in the same year, uh, Peter Constantine, when an, uh, Andy Bistiti uh, published a paper um, looking at fluid dynamics in Bessoff spaces and proved that if U, the velocity vector, is in the Bessoff space, 
b alpha 3 infinity with alpha greater than a third, then pi is equal to zero. A little bit later, uh, Duchamp and Robert gave a different argument, um, maybe a somewhat an argument closer to uh, the, the physical situation and proved energy conservation under a slightly weaker assumption than um, this assumption. So yes, we know that um, the, uh, under um, these smoothness conditions, we, we are in the situation of conservation of energy in the Onsarka conjecture. Now, um, uh, what is now oh, quite a long time ago, 2008, um, uh, Alexei Cheskadov, Peter Konstantin, myself, and Roman Schwitkoy um, proved another Bessov space con uh, condition ensuring that pi is equal to zero. Uh, so again, recall what pi is. Pi is this energy flux term um, coming from the nonlinearity in the Euler uh, equation. Um, we considered a littlewood paley formulation for this expression, defining the flux pi sub j through a sphere of radius 2 to the j uh, in frequency space as this expression. And uh, sj is this um, cut, is, is the smoothing function uh, defined in a wave number space via this um, smooth cutoff function, um, uh, cutoff in uh, shells of radius 2 to the j. So with this definition, this littlewood paley formulation definition of pi sub j as the flux through a sphere of radius 2 to the j in frequency space, the total flux um, in our fluid um, will be the limit as j goes to infinity of this pi sub j. And then we use the, this basically this expression to obtain a lower bound, or rather, sorry, an, uh, an upper bound on pi sub j. Um, so, and this expression that sits here, um, I've written down in terms of little with paley pieces of our velocity vector. Um, and this expression is valid for any divergence free um, any divergence free vector u in three dimensions. It would be valid in other direct dimensions too, but the actual numbers would change. So this expression um, tells us several things. So here, u sub j is the Littlewood Pay the jth Littlewood Paley piece of u um, defined in this fashion. Um, and if we recall the definition of Bessov spaces, if u is in the Bessov space v one third three, and I write this as infinity vanishing, this more conventionally, I believe is written as C zero or sometimes C capital N. Um, this means that the limit as j goes to infinity of two to the j times uh, the cube of the L three norm of the Littlewood Paley piece goes to zero. If uh, this, object goes to um, a finite number, then we are in the best of space B one third three infinity without the vanishing condition. So the some implications of this bound are the following. Um, if we had a solution to 3D Euler that was in this best of space, then we have conservation of energy of the solutions because this statement that this goes to zero is j goes to infinity ensures that this term goes to zero um, and our, as j goes to infinity, so our total flux is zero. So we have conservation of energy um, for solutions of the 3D Euler equation follows from this in the function space that I've written here. So uh, L3 in time and B133 infinity vanishing in space. Um, there are some other implications that follow from this particular bound. Um, this term uh, here that we have two to the minus two thirds and the, then the difference between the index i and the index j shows that when i and j are far apart, uh, this term is um, decreasing. Um, so the contribution from um, the interaction of the modes that are far apart in Fourier space um, becomes less and less important. Um, the main contributions are going to be where i and j are close together. Um, and as I say, so we have these implications of the bound. First of all, pi is equal to zero in this function space. 
and then that energy transfer is mainly controlled by local interactions. Uh, and this locality of cas cascades is one of the key ideas in turbulence, has been for many years, one of the key ideas, ideas in turbulence theory and seems to be justified um, by experiments. Um, now, um, uh, just another point to note of, um, that uh, if U is in the space B one third three infinity without the vanishing condition, uh, and there are sufficiently wide gaps in the Fourier spectrum, then what we can also show that the flux is equal to zero. Um, so this bound uh, as a bound is sharp in the sense that we can construct a divergence free three dimensional uh, vector field uh, in the space B one third three infinity for which pi is non-zero. So this is interesting, but not uh, sort of vitally interesting as it would be if this weren't this um, object that we construct were actually a solution to the three-dimensional, uh, the unforced three-dimensional Euler equation. Um, it is not, it would be wonderful if it was. Um, and we conjecture that there exists a solution to the three-dimensional Euler equation in this class, um, L3 in time and B third one, B one third three infinity uh, in uh, space that does dissipate energy. And we call this class on saga critical. To date, there's no example for this conjecture, but um, uh, the feeling that uh, some of us in the business have is this where the, this is where um, a physically relevant um, uh, flow um, that will give us um, anomalous dissipation will be living. So, well, in terms of the negative, or at least the um, dissipation side of Onsaga's conjecture, um, whether we should call that positive or negative is a matter, um, maybe the words negative and positive shouldn't be used. Um, in fact, the more reasonable usage of the words, as I think Camillo um, might say, is um, whether we're in the, the rigidity side or the flexibility side uh, of Onsaga's conjecture. So construction of examples of very weak solutions of, um, of Euler where energy is not conserved goes back a number of decades, with the first one being written by Vladimir Schaeffer and then a little bit later by uh, Sasha Schnellman. Um, but these very, very um, strange uh, solutions are very are weak solutions of Euler, but they exist only in L2. They have no smoothness at all. Um, and then, um, uh, in the past decade, um, a great breakthrough came in this uh, uh, in the Euler uh, conjecture on in the Onsaga's conjecture for the Euler equation, um, with uh, Camillo and Laszlo um, introducing methods of convex integration uh, based from the works of Nash uh, to the Euler equations, and, and then then in this series of papers. Um, they climbed what one can think of as the uh, Onsaga ladder, um, proving or uh, the existence and demonstrating the existence of non-conservation uh, uh, examples uh, in the space LT, uh, L infinity in time, uh, C alpha in space, starting off with an, an alpha that is less than a tenth, and then improving in, um, in these succeeding papers still using convex integration, but refining uh, the building blocks um, and that were used in the convex integration techniques um, and refining the alpha um, to become closer and closer to the actual one third um, conjectured by Ansaga. Um, and here again is a <laughs> situation where uh, I should be updating my slides um, with the word hot off the press, maybe isn't quite true, but it's still very warm off the press. Um, so Phil Isett in um, 2016 published a paper where he showed that for any alpha less than one third, uh, he constructs weak solutions to the three-dimensional Euler equation in the class uh, uh, CT, um, C alpha in X. Uh, that have non-empty compact support uh, in time and therefore fail to conserve total kinetic energy. And I'm sure 
Um, you have all, or at least some of you in the audience, have heard about um, and maybe heard directly from Phil uh, concerning this paper. Then a little bit later, um, the again, um, a, a further development uh, by uh, Tristan Camillo, Laszlo and Vlad, um, that given any beta less than a third and a time interval zero to capital T and any smooth energy profile E of T, there exists a weak solution uh, to the Euler equation um, in this function space um, with the energy being, being exactly this given profile E of T for time in our um, time interval. So in other words, dissipative solutions to the Euler equation of this sort are typical in the appropriate space of subsolutions. Um, and to rent to mention another uh, interesting result um, by um, Tristan and Vlad, uh, and this is in the context of Navier-Stokes equations, um, where it might be less obvious to use them, these methods coming from convex integration. Um, they proved that the weak solutions of the three-dimensional Navier-Stokes equations are not unique in the class of weak solutions with finite energy. Um, and they used, again, convex integration type construction with intermittent Beltrami flows as building blocks. And uh, specifically, they showed that for any beta greater than zero, but I don't think they gave a value, a specific value for beta, um, that um, such there exists such a beta, such that for any non-negative smooth functions E of T, there exists a velocity field in for the Navier-Stokes weak solutions of the Navier-Stokes equations in this function space, such that uh, the kinetic energy of this solution is equal to E of T in a given time interval. So um, these uh, constructions, both now for Euler and for Navier-Stokes, are very weak solutions, but weak solutions with some smoothness. Um, but one could say they are, well, they they are in fact described as wild solutions. And one can definitely ask, are these solutions physically reasonable um, in, in any sense? Uh, so there, this is really exciting, um, but are we connecting Euler and Kolmogorov? Are we connecting the dissipation anomaly? and are we connecting anomalous dis with anomalous dissipation using these very wild solutions, which maybe we will, maybe we won't, um, but it isn't entirely unreasonable to, to think about, once again, um, Euler, Navier-Stokes, Onsaga, and Kolmogorov and the connection um, in the context of turbulence. Well, as I mentioned earlier on, this um, so connection between the two via anomalous dissipation and the dissipation anomaly um, would be wonderful to prove directly from the Euler and Navier-Stokes equations themselves. But so far, that is a challenge that has not been um, solved. Uh, so what, does, what do mathematicians do when they can't do the actual problem that they'd like to do? Well, they look for something simpler. And something simpler in the context of the fluid equations and turbulence um, is, uh, has been examined over the decades. Um, uh, and given the name dyadic models or sometimes shell models for turbulence. And we have our very own favorite shell model. And that's what I'll be describing to you in the remainder of my talk. So this particular shell model that I'll be discussing um, was inspired by the bound that I wrote down earlier. Uh, so this, this is a bound on the flux, um, or at least the, uh, the flux through the, the J shell in a decomposition in Fourier space. Um, this, bound, this expression for the bound, as I say, um, gives among other things, uh, a condition for, uh, uh, for conservation of energy for Euler, it also showed this locality feature um, uh, for, for the expression for the flux. Um, and it gave actually some power, some specific um, value or specific 
information in, in terms of these little wood paley pieces and this power um, of two sitting here. So inspired by this bound, um, we define a model. So this is very much uh, a model, a model for um, our turbulent processes in terms not of vector fields, but on a sequence, an infinite sequence of scalar functions, fun scalar functions of time labeled by uh, J, uh, J being uh, the, um, the, the shell decomposition that we're talking about in Fourier space. Um, so again, a sequence, an infinite sequence of scalar fields that are functions of time. So this is how we're going to define our model. And we're going to impose a localization on the model, a localization which is um, representing in a rather crude fashion um, the nonlinear interactions in the Euler equation themselves, this u dot grad u term, um, will impose a localization on nearest neighbor interactions only. So we say this expression here in our bound uh, implies a certain amount of localization uh, is actually true for the flux, but we are going to impose a very strong localization only nearest neighbor interactions. So in particular, what is our model going to be? Well, we've, we've defined um, this expression um, u sub j via u sub j squared, and u sub j squared, the scalar, is going to be defined to be the energy in the jth shell. We'll define a jth flux term, uh, again, inspired by the bound, um, to be an expression of this sort, two to the cj multiplied by an in, uh, a nonlinear interaction term with only nearest neighbor interactions. And um, it's very, very specific in our model. We're defining it to be this, uj squared multiplied by um, uj plus one. Uh, so this is the flux through the jth shell um, corresponding to wave number two to the j. So with this definition of our flux and definition of this expression as an energy, the energy balance equation for our model will be that the time rate of change of the energy in this jth shell through the jth shell will be the difference of the flux um, going in and coming out. If we're looking at a, the Navier-Stokes type model, then we also need a term coming from the Laplacian, and that will be this viscosity term multiplied by, um, well, the Laplacian most naturally is modeled in this dyadic sense as two to the two J. Um, and here now we've multiplied the energy equation while multiplying uh, the uh, Laplacian of U by U. So that's giving us obviously a UJ squared term. And then we may, may have a forcing and we're mul simply multiplied by everything by U to the J, that forcing term uh, in the energy balance will be FJ UJ. If, so, uh, sorry, if you, uh, is the only change to the actual equations, the local, the fact that you're doing nearest neighbor localization or is there more? The, well, we're, we're doing nearest neighbor localization. We're doing it, um, uh, we also have turned our problem from a problem for three-dimensional vectors. To scalars. Yeah. To scalars. So that, I mean, that, that's a huge difference. Um, okay. so, so those are the two huge differences. We're dealing with scalar equations. So we've, in some sense, we've blurred the energy. So we, we're just approximating some energy in the jth shell. Um, and then we're just taking nearest neighbor interactions. And then also, and in, of course- and In terms um, of this yoga of modeling, uh, a simpler model, how do we, I mean, how do experts decide what's good and what's bad? I, I mean, I remember Maida was doing things like this years ago. Look, there, there have been a lot of models. Yeah, um, so. um, some of them with different names. There's a, something called a Goy model, an Obokov model, the Maida models. So I'm asking um, what we should be, what's the measure of a model being good? You mean, uh, if it well, comes um, up with the features you're looking for? Yes. <laughs> yeah. And this particular model, um, with these very special signs, this, the signs are important, and these very, this very special way of uh, modeling the nonlinear term. This model, as I will describe to you, we can prove 
everything that we'd like to prove uh, in terms of the connection, the sort of turbulence connections between Euler and um, uh, Navia Stokes, between Onsaga and Kolmogorov. So this model has that big plus, <laughs> um, but it is, it is absolutely a model. Now, something that's interesting for this model, and when I show you the, um, so here, here is the system of ODEs equivalent to the model. So we'll, with the, we're starting at J equals zero, um, and then J runs from zero to infinity. So here is the zeroth term in our system of ODEs. Here is the jth term in the system of our ODEs. And this equation, it's fairly easy to see. If you start with non-negative data, um, the solution U, uj of t will stay non-negative. So that's, that's a very nice feature of this particular model. Um, and it, what it's meaning is that um, we've got an energy cascade where the energy is being pushed by this very special choice of, of the nonlinearity. It's being pushed. And all the what time. is C here? Uh, you, you what is a... C? Yes. Yeah. C, is, C is interesting. OK, so C at the moment is just a constant. Um, what should it be? It could be, well, as it stands in just writing the model, it could be anything. However, um, C, there is a reason for C. Um, let's see if I can go back. Does this take me back? Uh, yes. So here we see C sitting here. And then when I talked about this model of um, coming or being inspired by the bound on an actual three-dimensional divergence free velocity vector, um, we see that we've got an L3 norm here. We've got the cube of the L3, the three norm, and we've got this term here uh, two to the i. So the appropriate power in the model of our two to the j is comes from this term and this term. Okay, but this is an L3 uh, norm. And as in our model, our model is being defined in terms of an L2 norm. So we need a some sort of comparison between the L2 norms and the L3 norms, and we use Bernstein's inequality. Um, whether or not it's fully saturated or not saturated to argue as to what this C should be. So the C isn't an arbitrary C. C is coming from the, um, our motivation and uh, that motivation will actually give us a C and says that the, the appropriate range of C lies between one and five over two. This connects with the uh, Kolmogorov's power law um, and in particular, um, uh, we have an identification now through Kolmogorov's power law of the, um, the this quantity D, which is the uh, Hausdorff dimension of the region of turbulent activity. Um, if D is equal to three, so that means turbulence basically is uniformly spread over our three-dimensional fluid, um, that will give rise to Kolmogorov's minus five thirds law. But if D is equal to zero, so that means that the region of turbulent activity is restricted to points, then we, then we get the minus eight, eight thirds law. Um, and uh, as far as the identification between our C and this D, it's C is equal to five, five minus D over two. So we have the identification that um, when C lies between um, one and five over two, D is going to lie between uh, zero and three. So um, this, this C is actually an important parameter from the point of view of these connections, and it's sometimes referred to as the intermittency parameter. So now what can we, what can we prove? Uh, could, you go, uh, could you go back to the previous slide for just a moment? Yes. Yeah, so are you defining D by, by this E of K? Uh, yes. So, okay. yeah. So, um, uh, as far as Kolmogorov, so th this is the energy density spectrum yeah. for Kolmogorov. Um, and Ko Kolmogorov gives arguments uh, for this Hausdorff dimension of the region of turbulent activity defined via the energy density spectrum. Okay. So, now I'm putting this together with um, basically how we have defined C via Bernstein's inequality, and we come up with this. Um, sort of comparability of the ranges. Thank you. Okay. 
So what can we prove? Um, well, basically, we can prove everything that we would like to prove um, for Euler Navier Stokes itself in the limit of vanishing viscosity. Uh, so in particular, in a series of papers published a while ago now, um, we consider that model. We define, we work now in Sobolev spaces. We don't have to be working in something as, uh, uh, as sort of fancy as Bessoff spaces. Um, and we define the Sobolev space um, in the usual fashion in terms of our uh, use of J squares. Um, so um, we can, this, uh, first of all, we, in the Euler case, that means we are neglecting the viscosity term nu, just setting nu equal to zero in our model. Um, we have solutions um, uh, that um, in the space little l2 for our model um, for all time, um, and they will be um, uh, C smooth in time. Um, then uh, on this family of solutions, we show that there is a fixed point and it's a unique fixed point. And for this particular model, that unique fixed point is completely explicit. Let me go back and just show you once again, these equations. So here, this is our system of equations. We're forcing only at the, at the zeroth mode, which is, for, which is consistent with what one would be interested in doing um, for actual turbulence. You want to see how the turbulent processes of the evolving according to this system are going to move the energy through where you're injecting it in at the zeroth mode throughout the whole system. So we force just here. And then it's very easy to see in the um, inviscid case. So this term disappears, this term disappears, but you've got an explicit expression for the fixed point. Really nice in the uh, Euler model. And that explicit expression uh, says that uh, the, uh, the j term in, for the fixed point just looks like two to the minus cj over three and then multiplied by the square root of the forcing. So this is the magnitude of the energy. So we have a fixed point, um, which, is, which is basically a fixed point that is um, this Onsaga critical expression, namely uh, the one, the, basically the one third expression coming uh, into the model, which of course is not surprising because partly we have constructed the model to ensure that. Uh, what is a little bit more interesting is that every solution blows up in finite time in, the, in this critical, this Onsaga critical function space, uh, HC over three. And as actually, I think it was Jonathan Mattingly said in the context of um, dyadic model he was looking at, um, there is, okay, blow up is interesting, but there's life after blow up. And life in fact is even more interesting after blow up. So the solutions are all sitting in L2, the solutions are in L2. So everything's fine as far as the definition of our solutions go. Um, but um, these, so we have blow up in finite time in this Onsaga critical space. And then the HS norms for all S less than C over three are locally square integrable. And these solutions dissipate energy. Um, they dissipate energy so that everything will ultimately go to the fixed point, And this fixed point is an exponential global attractor. So our unidirectional energy cascade, which we have built into the model for partly for this reason, um, produces finite time blow up followed by anomalous dissipation. And this result can be proved for all C in this um, arguably reasonable range between one and five over two. So, we, so we've got, we prove the existence of um, anomalous dissipation um, for our Euler model um, exactly as we would love to do for Kant for the Euler equation itself. So now uh, we go to the viscous model. So that's, that's the model where we are keeping the Navier-Stokes type term. Again, we're forcing only at the zeroth mode. We have initial data uh, in L2 that is non-negative. And as I commented, the model construct has been constructed so that if it's initially non-negative, the solution always stays non-negative. Uh, so first result is for the Navier-Stokes model, the viscous model, there exists a solution uh, that I'm labeling uh, with, or with a subscript 
new to show it's viscous um, in, and that will be in C1. And again, spit the solution each for each component J will be non-zero, sorry, non-negative uh, for all time. And this satisfies the energy inequality, namely it satisfies the appropriate energy balance equation for the model. And then once again, there is a unique fixed point uh, you knew no longer is this fixed point explicit, but we can uh, show enough of the properties of the fixed point to show that it is an, an exponential global attractor. And then the limit as viscosity goes to zero, the fixed point of the viscous model goes to the fixed point of the inviscid model, this explicit quantity. Furthermore, we have uh, that um, the limit is uh, T goes to infinity of one over T, the integral from zero to T now of the energy dissipation. So this is the energy dissipation rate uh, averaged over time goes to a quantity uh, that is positive. And that quantity is exactly uh, the uh, energy dissipation rate of the uh, Euler model that we have an explicit expression for in terms of the, in terms of, um, of the basically of the forcing because we have an explicit expression for the um, uh, the fixed point of the Euler model. Could I so, ask a question about this fixed point that you're talking about? Is this a, a stochastic fixed point? No, no. At the moment, this is deterministic. Um, in in the, the the last sort of uh, five minutes of my talk, I okay. will say what happens when it's stochastic. So okay. stochastic, I think, is somewhat more interesting because turbulence seems more reasonably a stochastic process than a deterministic yes. process. Yeah. Um, and everything that we can prove rather easily for um, the deterministic case, you know, this result that um, Onsaga and Kolmogorov are confirmed, we can do for the stochastic case too, but it's a distinctly more complicated proof. So. Let me just now move on uh, to the stochastically forced problem. So now, again, the same system, um, infinitely. Can I ask, uh, so, sorry, I still want to go back to your model. Yes. So you don't know how to drop the nearest neighbor. Can you drop, can you do this? You, you, there are two parts that the model is not accurate. One is scalar. Yes. Which probably is very serious. By the way. Uh, yes. And, and the other is nearest neighbor. The other is the nearest neighbor. Really, can can you relax that, or have you not tried? For, to get to get these results, no. Um, as I mentioned, that, there lost? are there are other models with different ways of modeling the nonlinearity, as we have here. Um, some models actually don't just have nearest neighbors; they have sort of three neighbors apart. Mm -hmm. um, but to my knowledge, you can prove very little with them. Oh, okay. Um, so. <laughs> and the positivity is absolutely important. This. And the positivity is very important. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. And the positivity comes is guaranteed by basically choosing this sign. And some models reverse the sign. They will put a minus sign here and a plus sign there, and then they don't get it. Now, why should why should the sign be as the sign as it is? The only argument for that is that it is that this positivity does in fact give you, um, uh, well, Onsaga and Kolmogorov exactly on the nose. So the model is nice because the model is nice. <laughs> so in the stochastically forced model, again, here's the model. So what sort of forcing do we use? So here is the forcing term, uh, sigma dW. And uh, W is a one-dimensional Brownian motion. And uh, the sigma measures the intensity of the noise. So the statistically invariant states of the, of the model are expected to encode the statistics of turbulence, um, turbulent flows as nu goes to zero. And our localized whiting time forcing serves as a proxy for generic large scale processes driving the turbulent cascade. And again, we put in the forcing only on the zeroth mode. And then what we're really interested in is, is the properties of the solutions to the stochastic system as the forcing moves cascades through the, through the modes. So not having much time now, um, again, this I'm basically just repeating here these basic elements of Kolmogorov's turbulence connecting um, the anomalous dissipation 
or turbulent dissipation for an Euler with the dis, um, dissipation anomaly, namely the positivity of the um, dissipation rate for Navier-Stokes in the limit of vanishing viscosity um, for, in terms of uh, stochastically forced um, Euler Navier-Stokes. And as I say, proving these directly from three-dimensional Navier-Stokes is an outstanding open problem. Um, there have been many results on stochastic um, uh, Navier-Stokes equations by many people over the decades, extremely interesting results in many cases, but not the, in some sense, the crucial result. Um, so what can we do for the model? Um, so the stochastically forced model, well, the basic properties of existence and uniqueness of solutions to the viscous system, and it can be proved in this whole range, C lang between one and five over two. Now, when, when we're trying to prove things, um, the actual size of C relative to two is important because the, um, the, the Laplacian type term um, is multiplied by two to the two J. These nonlinear terms are multiplied by two to the CJ. So two can be important as to whether we've got a balance between the nonlinearity and the viscous diffusion. Um, in, for some questions, and the discussion I gave of the deterministic case, we can prove the results for C in the whole range, but for some of the problems for um, the stochastically forced pro um, problem, are the results are proved for, um, where C is between one and two. But the, the basic property, properties of existence and uniqueness of solutions can be proved in the whole range. Um, so this is an actual statement of the existence and uniqueness theorems in our paper. No time to explain it, but if anyone would like to see the paper, I'd love to show it to them. Um, so what we, we established new independent moment bounds uh, for the statistically stationary states, uh, steady states for the viscous model, um, and then use those to pass uh, to the inviscid limit in this class of statistically stationary solutions uh, and estab establish the existence of uh, stationary solutions to the inviscid model, and these stationary solutions in this exhibit a, a form of uh, turbulent or anomalous dissipation. Um, and here is the statement of that theorem. Um, and these uh, um, uh, invariant measures uh, for the inviscid model uh, experience anomalous dissipation. And as you can see, maybe, um, uh, from these terms involving uh, the 2CJ over the three type terms. Um, they're consistent with the anomalous, um, they're consistent with an, the Onsaga critical space, HC over three, and with Kolmogorov's spectrum. Um, and then we were interested in the long-term behavior of um, the solutions to these models. Um, so we wanted to study the attraction prop properties of the viscous model. And now this is where um, for, we were able to um, obtain results in the, in the regime where C lies between one and two. And the equations in this, for C in this re regime are semi-linear and we're able to use the sort of Markovian framework, uh, Malyavan calculus and infinite dimensional for this infinite dimensional system, um, basically taking ideas of Hira and Mattingly, um, who looked at actually stochastically forced 2D uh, Navier-Stokes um, and um, gave, defined uh, a somewhat weaker um, notion than the notion, classical notion of strong fella, something they called asymptotic strong fella and asymptotic strong fellow will hold uh, for a semi-linear system when certain um, properties can be uh, shown. Uh, and these are the, the necessary properties um, for Hira and Mattingly's uh, approach to asymptotic strong fellow, um, needing an infinite dimensional analog, the home under bracket condition, exponential moment bounds, and uh, foyage prodi type estimates. So we're able to show that these can be established for our um, stochastically forced viscous model and that, uh, um, that enables us 
um, to, to prove that for any positive viscosity, there exists a unique invariant measure, uh, view nu, of the Markov semigroup induced by this system. And it's a very, it's a, we have very good properties. In fact, it's ergodic and exponentially mixing. And so here is the actual statement of the theorem for, for our unique invariant measures um, for the uh, stochastic uh, dyadic model um, corresponding to any initial condition uh, in L2. Um, and then using this, um, we can um, look at the limit of vanishing viscosity um, we can obtain an expression for the mean dissipation rate of energy um, and show that it is bounded below independent of nu. And even more than that, we can um, actually uh, explicitly uh, obtain an expression for this um, dissipation rate um, in the limit of vanishing viscosity. And it's an explicit expression, sigma, sigma squared over two, sigma being the strength of the noise. Um, and this dissipation anomaly matches exactly uh, the com computation of the viscid anomalous dissipation uh, for the inviscid model. So once again, the stochastically forced model produces just what we would like um, in terms of both uh, Onsaga's conjecture, the existence of uh, turbulent dissipation and um, Kolmogorov's um, zeroth law of turbulence. So thank you very much. <laughs> um, and uh, the paper for the, uh, the results con concerning the stochastic deforced model uh, appeared in Annals ERHP uh, a few years ago. Thank you. Questions? Uh, now, so these results depend upon your, your C. I, I mean, do, do these things match Kolmogorov for all values? Yes, they, well, yes, they basically match Kolmogorov. Um, the, uh, the results um, in terms of the Markovian structure um, uh, for our Navier Stokes model um, approved in the situation that would be analogous to Kolmogorov's um, description um, as to whether or not turbulence is uh, sort of uniformly distributed or the Hausdorff dimension of the turbulence is less than three. So our results for, the, um, for that Markovian properties, that um, unique ergodic uh, invariant measure, um, they are proved when C lies between one and two, which means that we can, um, in some sense, have a smaller Hausdorff dimension than three, but we can't go all the way to points. Uh, but, but, e pretty, but everything else that I described can be proved for the full regime of C, which means in, some, in this context of um, uh, Kolmogorov's notions, um, yes, could, can be improved for all phys physically relevant C. I have two questions. One is whether any of these models are physically interesting themselves. And you, let me just ask my second question too. Second one is purely philosophical. This, uh, I guess, Navius blow up question uh, has many, I mean, many people solving it who are claiming to solve it. I'm sure just like with the Riemann hypothesis, it's got a lot of attention. And one use in the case of the Riemann hypothesis for model problems is a, is a way to say that some method can't possibly work because yes. what you're doing just uses X, Y, and Z. And then in this model, your argument would work and you would get the, the opposite of, or you can show it's not true. So the models, so, I mean, we, I, at, the, at the annals, we get probably five proofs of Riemann a week Yes. <laughs> and a lot of them can be <laughs> dismissed by saying, I mean, not that the reader ever listens to what you might write, but you can say, look, you've never used X, Y, and Z, and here's a situation, a model situation, where Riemann's false, and your arguments would work there. All you're using is X and Y. Yes. Uh, and so maybe you'd say, well, uh, for, for 
smoothness and lack of blow up, you can't, uh, you have to exploit the three dimensions in some kind of mm -hmm. way. Mm -hmm. So I'm asking whether these models uh, can be used for that. And then a more serious question was whether your models actually have a physical meaning by themselves without just um, model well, something you, that might be some different. You're writing a coupled system of ordinary differential equations. Yes. An, an infinite couple system. Inf infinite couple system, which seems very interesting. And maybe it's got a physical meaning itself. No? Um, well, to answer your first question, um, yes, definitely. Um, these models can be used <laughs> in, in some sense to test what might or might not be feasible um, for the actual equations. And there's a rather nice paper of Terry Tao that did that. Um, now it's probably about three or four years old, um, where he looked at pretty much the models that I'm talking about, but introduced another little wrinkle to the model. Um, and he was able to prove um, finite time blow up for that wrinkled model of Navier-Stokes and concluded from um, what he was able to do for the, for the wrinkled model um, that that showed that his basically his toolbox of, of um, analysis, which is a pretty good toolbox, couldn't be used. Uh, okay, so uh, that's exactly tool, my question. It's yeah. exactly yes. Yeah, so it's exactly what you're talking about. Right, so but you, I, I didn't have it, I didn't have it in mind to use it on him. I had in mind to use it on. on, use it on a, well, if, <laughs> if, Terry, if Terry can use it interestingly, <laughs> but interestingly in this negative direction that. Um, uh, basically saying that uh, um, you know, the known tools of analysis um, will not are not satisfactory at the moment to answer right. the question yep. of finite time blowout in Navier-Stokes. Right. That's interesting. Absolutely, but, uh, absolutely, because it tells um, you what kind of tools you you have to. Yeah. So, so basically, a new tool is needed. Was yeah. his conclusion? Um, okay. Working with, um, as I say, a, a slight variant of the model that I just just described. I. I Sounds very interesting. Yeah, thanks. No, and then in terms of the in terms of whether these models actually um, are telling you about maybe a physical system other than um, fluids, well, possibly yes. I mean, you, there are there certainly there are all these um, models of um, uh, sort of balls knocking each other backwards and forwards, yeah. um, and modeled by um, ODEs. If you mm -hmm. you might consider a sort of an infinite string of, of mm -hmm. atoms um, and whose, inter, whose nonlinear inter interaction is exactly the nonlinear interaction in the model. Um, yeah. so, that's not impossible. Yeah, you want physicists to pick it up, okay. <laughs> yes, yes, please. <laughs> I, have, I have a couple of questions and, 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 uh, and one comment. So one question is, your, so in your model, your inviscid limit is well posed. Oh yes. Right. Yes. So yes. It's, it's it's. I didn't get that wrong. No, no, it is well posed. No, yes. so, so the second question is, what are Foyash body estimates? Oh, let me see. I'd have to go and dig back in the paper exactly. Uh, the um, was, uh, they they occur in our they occur in our the appendix. Um, it, uh, um, why are they important? Um, we to find, I, I just at the moment, since the paper is um, a few years old, I to, I'd have to go back and look exactly where they are used. Okay. Okay, yeah, yeah. So, so, so the comment is that I am actually at the receiving end of what um, Peter is saying, right? So the, uh, well, I don't get five a week, five, five solutions a week of the Navier Stokes, but you know, a couple mm -hmm. of every month mm -hmm. you get. So one of the drawback of 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 uh, Tao's paper is that you can't use it for most crackpots because most crackpots actually would use some formulation with the vorticity inside. Yes. And 
And okay, so his model is so, so what, what this model is showing is that you can't use energy estimates essentially for solving the question, or you, you can't use like harmonic analysis estimates on 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 the yes. uh, on the um, on the nonlinearity, right? <laughs> but somehow the average crack so, but yeah. the average crack but is not that good. It's not using such a fancy way. So the average crack but is actually trying to crank some computations on Bortisti and then <laughs> yeah, you, can, you don't have a ready-made argument just to say, okay, look, it doesn't work. Just make sure this is not recorded this one. So, uh, yes. Sure <laughs> yeah. no, I, mean, I mean I'm just telling I mean I even I'm, well there's you'll have these crack parts after you. Sorry. Oh, yeah. I mean, like, so you you you're gonna love it actually. So I think one of them, one of them actually, what the, the last one I got uh, was solving Nadia Stokes through the Riemann hypothesis. I think. Uh huh. Uh huh. <laughs> Thank you. Well, combine the two uh, together. Uh, <laughs> you know the standard rejection there. <laughs> most I'm sure it was at Inventionis. Most Inventionis papers have one if if. They are really good and might have one new idea. A, a paper with two new ideas is too much. <laughs> a paper with two new ideas is certainly, exactly. certainly wrong. <laughs> um, well, as you, you may notice, I, I'm the uh, chief editor of the AMS Bulletin. You, um, you, you get that too? Probably I get, um, not quite as often as you do, but uh, papers that uh, claim to prove uh, the Riemann hypothesis or um, and also, but very, very rarely do I get actually another stokes. Um, it's much more likely the crackpots go in for number three. Peter, do you have the, do you, do you, do you maintain a database? No, but I think if you went to you ask the annals, they, uh, I mean, at any given moment, there must be a hundred papers. I don't deal with them quickly and then I get shot at it. Uh, but there are a lot of them, and I don't want to waste other people's time usually. Right. Very often, I can say uh, uh, this paper uh, would apply in this situation, and I just look for certain things like this, and then, and you like if they're just using the functional equation, uh -huh. then it's easy to see that that is not sufficient to prove it. And uh, ninety-nine percent of crackpots, they're not crackpots, they usually be retired. Uh, engineers or physicists who know what an analytic function is and then this function this problem looks very beautiful we are at zeros and they just use the functional equation and then uh, you say well uh, yes. i don't have to, I don't have to <laughs> look at paper because it applies where it's false and then they then you uh, what you have to avoid is getting into a back and forth of why it's false yeah mm -hmm. we do maintain we do maintain uh, uh, together with another couple of experts a database actually which has been which has been pretty useful because I didn't realize it, but in time I got actually the same person submitting, like you know, a couple of years later, the same proof. Just changed, just changed, just changed the lemma somewhere. <laughs> so one of the last submissions, one of the last submissions was by the same person, and then I had the PDF comparison, right? So and the person just changed a couple of paragraphs in in, in thirty pages paper. So I replied, no way. You know, this is not, this is not, this is not honest. You yeah. just changed two paragraphs in section, whatever, whatever, but it's exactly the same submission. <laughs> that doesn't solve the problem. But, but the solution will arrive on your desk one day. You'll Sorry? <laughs> These things do get solved eventually, and it could easily be by, most likely by an outsider. Yeah. Yeah, well, sure, sure. Sure. Really, you think sure. So? But you recognize, you recognize, uh, you know, you recognize, uh, you recognize attempts that make sense from attempts that don't make sense. Yeah, right. Uh, uh, that's you, you, you recognize that there's something new. Why the person's got a new idea? They will yeah. say. Yes. Anyway, I think I've taken you on a, a rabbit <laughs> down a rabbit <laughs> hole. That wasn't the plan. I was just trying to get a picture of models uh, and what you described about Terry is very interesting yeah no but that's definitely so that's very definitely uh, definitely useful at least in 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 in, in quite a few of them yes but, but by the way there's uh, so there's a uh, uh, there's a predated uh, there's there, there's something which not so many people maybe pay attention to in the 80s uh, by Sheffer so Sheffer has I still haven't Peter. introduced you to Sheffer. Uh, he taught me. I, I took a class from him when I was a graduate student. So, so Sheffer, but Sheffer, he's very shy. He's extremely shy. He wouldn't come to Camilla's lectures. I invited 
when Camilla gave the vile lectures, I personally invited him from Rutgers. He didn't come. No. So Sheffer, Sheffer has a paper in which he shows that if you just take, uh, say, what Caffarelli con Nirenberg, uh, what are the basic tools of Caffarelli con Nirenberg to actually do the partial legality theorem theory, then you cannot do actually better than that. Yeah. Interesting. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, it just shows it just shows that if you have a dissipative term of Navier Stokes on the right hand side, which would give you just you know the energy inequality at the local level and which is divergence free so that it would apply I mean it would allow you actually to apply the Laplace equation to the pressure so you just have the two tools that you're actually using in Caffarelli con Nirenberg and in his works to get the partial regularity then you can actually saturate the 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 host of uh, bound by by Caffarelli con oh, Nirenberg you can you can actually show that that is sharp interesting and that that's an old paper but not a super old paper uh that's I think like 84 Five eighty six, something like that, and eighty seven also. Eighty seven, eighty seven, and actually, Wojtek has uh, a Wojtek who's 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 uh, yeah. uh, here. Actually, Wojtek has a version of that which is improved and which is understandable by mortals. <laughs> <laughs> but the Shepherd's version is not. Well, Shepherd's version is not understandable by mortals. Not not that not that much, at least, not to me. Interesting. So you can you can read it you can read it on Wojtek um, on Wojtek version. Good. I'll talk to Wojtek about it. Yeah. After all, our offices are next to each other, but physically we don't we haven't met. We don't have much contact. <laughs> no. Okay. Very well. So uh, I'm well. I don't want to stop the lively discussion. Uh, of course, if you uh, uh, if you want to go over, you can. But uh, let me just close maybe the seminar here. And let me leave. I'm leaving for a run right now. Doesn't look that appealing. Yeah, it's still raining. It's raining. So have a nice evening. <laughs>